You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Angelscapes with host Nancy Smith, your direct connection to finding your soul's power and wisdom. Join Nancy, Akashic Medium, in this interactive show to explore tools and steps you can take to create peace, calm, and confidence in your life. So now, please welcome the host of Angelscapes, Nancy Smith. Hi there. Is truth really stranger than fiction? What if the leading fiction writers are trying to tell us something in a way that no one else can? Can intuition and telepathy be used as a resource to keep us safe? And can telepaths identify terrorists determined to destroy the United States with nuclear weapons before it's too late? The United States government and military keep an open mind as to what people are capable of in this world, so I wonder what they're going to do with it, or or are they doing anything with it? If people with remarkable abilities do exist, must they be identified, studied, and prevented from working against our national security interests? That's a thought, too. Tonight's guest has toyed with these questions in her sci-fi novel, Mind Reacher. This is Angel Scapes, and I'm your host, Nancy Smith, and I brought Irene Barron on, who's the author of Mind Reacher. She's the top female writer of 2020 by the International Associations of Top Professionals for her outstanding leadership and commitment to the industry. And Irene was selected for the 2020 Albert Nelson Marquis Lifetime Achievement Award by Marquis Who's Who's and has been recognized by the Continental Who's Who's as a 2021 International Top Professional in Education. Irene has an amazing background. She's written other books besides Mind Reachers, um, and she um, has researched um, so much science. She has a, a really powerful science background, and she began her career as an informationist information specialist under the contract of to the office of the secretary of defense advanced research projects agency research and development center and she worked in thailand during the vietnam war and it was through this experience that she began collecting the data and information to develop what would be called this novel the mind reacher so welcome irene to the show i'm so excited to um, talk to you about this Thank you, Nancy. I'm very glad to be here, and hopefully your audience will chime in with some questions later, too. Oh, I hope so, too. Yeah, well, I'll send out the phone number um, at, at the break time. Um, what, but before we, before I get everyone calling in, um, I, what I wanted to do is just ask you about, we had talked about actually science, how science has been, you know, in college and your studies, the, the, that's been very important to you. Yeah. And, and most people, when they study a science, they choose chemistry or physics or biology or geology, and they home in on one field of science and specialize. But mine is a general science where I studied all the sciences um, so that I could interrelate one science with another. So when I hear something in one, I can pull that and use that in a see how it relates to a different science, and I come up with things that other people hadn't thought of because they are have a very narrow reference. Um, so my science was, I began um, at Hiram College, and one of the unique ones I uh, studied was astronomy, which very few people study astronomy. Um, but that gave me a basis for the first book I wrote, which was, uh, I discovered the Christmas star using NASA astronomy program, and that was considered the best Christian education book the year it was published, which was 2013. So it's still available, 
and yeah. a fun book, but that's, that's astronomy. And but this one, in my nature, is all about uh, telepaths, which uh, the United States began studying them. Um, the United States government and Project Stargate in 1978. Really, 1978, Stargate. It was called Stargate. Oh. Yeah, and then they stopped that in 1995. But the United States Army started studying people with uh, telepathic ability back in the 1950s, and they have done so ever since. Uh, it's uh, quite exciting to read some yeah. of the things that they have come up with. One now, of the main you, topics nowadays okay. would be if you if you were in combat and you had someone in combat that was a telepath. And they could tell, they could read minds of the enemy, and they could know where the attack was going to be, who's going to do it, and give you much data, which before you might be able to get by satellite nowadays. So did you did you have any, um, when you did your service time, when you were working, I think you said the Vietnam War, you were in, you were in Thailand, did, did you ever run into any telepaths or did you, or any, this kind of work for the government? No, my work was primarily gathering data and research and counterinsurgency for the CETO uh, treaty uh, agreement with Thailand. In case they were ever invaded, the United States was under a treaty organization to mm -hmm. come to their wow. aid. But wow. there was no data available, so we had to go out and collect the data. For example, I was helping write a top secret book on counterinsurgency, and in getting the data that I was doing the geology and the um, hydrology on the Mekong River so we would fly helicopters in that area I directed the aerial photography for the book um, in addition to many other things that I did but but that was fun but no I did not meet a telepath at that time that I was aware of <laughs> <laughs> they may not say have you have you met anyone since then do you suppose? I think so. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause you, I mean, you, you have such a good understanding of, of the tele telepathic um, concept yeah. in the book. Do you, um, let's talk a little bit more about telepathy, because I want to go back and talk about your, your background that helped you to write this book. But you fr brought in some, with the telepathic and the other things, you brought in some really um, poignant, especially for those who are as for intuitive, points um or a person was do you think intuition and telepathy can be used as a resource to keep us safe i know that it, we know that it has and you've read about it but where do you stand on it now after you've researched and written the book um i know more about it now and i'm more aware of it um i when scientific american magazine came out with a new magazine. It was called Scientific American Mind, M-I-N-D. And I subscribed immediately, and it's still my favorite magazine ever, ever. Um, and I keep all the copies of the prints that they originally started. Um, but they went into um, only a digital book, so now you only have mm -hmm. can read it online or have to okay. print it out or something. But that's where there are people that have read Mind Reacher said they never learned so much about the mind. And they just didn't want it to stop because it was so intriguing. And so I, I used data from there and put it in a way that could be easily out. There's a lot of static there. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to, um, you know what, let's fix that. We're going to go on a break. Um, and, and we'll be right back with Irene to talk more about, you know, how she put telepathy ideas into the, her novel. If you would like to call in and, ha and ask Irene a question, the call-in number is 866-451-1451. And um, you are listening to Angelscapes with Nancy Smith on BBM Global Network. We'll be right back. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations. Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings a 
over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. And welcome back. You're listening to Angelscapes with Nancy Smith. We are with Irene Barron. Um, we're talking about her science fiction um, novel, Mind Reacher, which includes a lot of telepathy and um, saving of the world through psychic abilities. Um, we're going to um, take calls if you have any questions for Irene, and the number is 866-451-1451. And if you would like to, while you're listening to the show, you can look up Irene on her website, Irene. Baron B A R O N dot com and uh, see her other books as well as um, read up on, on Mind Reacher. So I read. Here we are again. Um, telepathy and saving the world. <clears throat> um, <laughs> yes. So in the book. Uh, yeah, in the okay, book. Go ahead. Yes, in the book there are things in the book that you feel could be real, that could really be happening in oh. the government now. So tell me about some of those things in the book. In the book, most people will not be able to tell if it's fact or fiction. And they they have no idea. But much of the information in the book is fact. And a, a hint to anyone that's listening, if you're not sure if what you're reading is fiction or fact, if you go to the back of the book, there is a glossary. If it's fact, it's in the glossary. And a lot of the things that are in the glossary say, whoa, I didn't know that. <laughs> and you're, you will learn a lot. Okay. Um, yeah. But and the, the premise of the book is that there are terrorists threatening the United States. And the new president wanted to take care of that. And he mentioned it at the cabinet meeting. And they said, well, if you want to find a terrorist, you're going to have to be able to read minds because that's the only way you could identify him. Right. So he he started this top secret project uh, to identify uh, terrorists using telepathy, but he didn't have any telepaths. So he started a secret organization to do that. And he knew if he tried to mention it to the public that he was going to have an organization of psychics, he would be laughed out of office. So um, what they did was they tried to find... Um, any telepath, they found one in the United States, and they used that one to find other ones uh, in okay. South Africa. When yes. I lived there. Tell me about South Africa. When I lived in Germany. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. I'm li- when I lived in Germany, I was reading uh, The Stars and Stripes, and it talked about some very high genius children that were born in South Africa in Johannesburg area. That by the age of three, they were doing their algebra of multiple languages, and they were just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant children, all born to uh, a project that was underdone to protect women from chemicals by this gynecologist. So in my idea, I thought, what if they were telepathic, not only telepathic, but communal telepathic, and that they, when one thought something, all the others did too. So that's the group of children who are now middle-aged, uh, that needs to be found to, 
they could identify telepaths from miles away or a terrorist from miles away. So that's the book. They're trying to find at least one of these to start with, and that would be that would put the president's organization. Maybe global peace would come from it if they could yeah. not only find the terrorists in the United States, but they could go worldwide and they could stop terrorism. Period. And that's a, that's a big possibility. And the army's been working on that since the 1950s. And if you can look it up online, there's United States Army telepaths or, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. There's, all, yeah. there's all kinds of information out there. And it's just fascinating to read. You don't realize what, what the human mind is capable of. You take a prodigy, a child that, oh, or a person, sometimes with an accident, they become a prodigy in some field that they didn't even know they knew. They, they become expert at, you know, piano or uh, mathematics or who knows what. And even children, how did, how did they get that information? Was it already there? So maybe these are things that we're learning about the human mind, which that we are just beginning to, to apply, honest, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally am with you on that one. There, there. I know that a little bit about, um, there's a movie out called Men Who Stare at Goats that talk about that program that started in the 1950s. And um, they, it's fascinating, totally fascinating. And um, um, so what is your opinion if people have these remarkable abilities and they actually do exist and, and they can... Um, they can do these things. You know, it's important to study them. But do you think that they're dangerous sometimes? Or how do, how do you, what is your opinion now? Or do you feel like they're like anybody else? That's a question, uh, which is addressed in the second book, which is still in the editing stages, and that they do come across one who has a little bit of um, ideas which are not very nice. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. And... Um, they are they are dealing with that, and but he agrees to work with them for a little while. But it's it's okay. possible that you know just like humans, they aren't all nice. No, so well, someone- yeah. In the Cold War, the the remote viewers were remote viewing the Russian remote viewers who were re- who were viewing the U.S. Army remote viewers. So I would think you could really come into all kinds of trouble. If somebody were to use their abilities for um, evil, and if you go online, it's, they have lessons how to become a remote viewer, what to do. And I was just looking at some, and I thought, oh, "Holy cow!" Oh <laughs> look yeah, at, look at that. No idea. They have online lessons on YouTube and etc. about remote viewing. But what was most intriguing to me about remote viewing was quite some time ago, this one fellow that he was remote viewing and he was letting his body and his mind go out into space and he discovered that Jupiter had a ring and everybody laughed because they knew that was stupid. You couldn't see any ring around Jupiter. But when Voyager went out, when it went beyond Jupiter, they had its camera turn around towards Jupiter with the sun in the background and with the sun in the background, that sun lit up a ring around yeah. Jupiter. And this was years before it was ever seen, you know, and that when I when I found that out, I thought, whoa, that yeah. is something, because when, when he first said Jupiter had a ring, you know, decades before, no one believed him, but, but it's a... Uh, that totally it's, proved. It's a it to- app yeah. and, viewing. and that's yeah. how they found Saddam Hussein had many layers underneath his... Uh, site where he had many floors underneath was a remote deer went down into them so Mm -hmm. there's all kinds of stories uh, with military using remote viewers and it started back in the 1950s with the u.s army phenomenal stuff really fascinated fascinating stuff in your personal world um but you through your world you like you were in your work in Thailand with the, and, and your work with the, the Vietnam War, and then later on as you moved through your life, what were some other pieces that you picked up from real life that you've applied to the book? I went into areas 
I went into areas that uh, no one, I'm, I'm blonde and blue eyes. And I came to the place where I had to dye my hair when I was over there because I stood out too much and wear dark sunglasses so they couldn't see my eyes. I'd wear long sleeves uh, and a hat. Oh. I had to kind of mask what I looked like because I, was, I would scare children. They'd turn around and see me, this blue-eyed blonde with white, light skin, and I was a monster to them. Oh, They'd my scream, gosh. Running. Oh, my gosh. Well, so, well listen, we're going to take a quick, quick little break, and okay, we can hatch up some some of your amazing stories that you've put into the book with, with some of the technology. Um, so when as we go on a break, again, you could look up irenebarron.com, read more about she's got two other amazing books, and um, you're listening to Angelscapes with Nancy Smith on BBM Global Network, and we'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick. Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. And welcome back. We're coming to you live from BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I'm your. This is Angelscapes. I'm your host Nancy Smith. And I want to remind you that we are taking calls. Eight six six four five one. One four five one, and welcome back, Irene. Um, you have a really cool story about a sniper in in the book, and you, I read online, and you actually told me that you were trained by the USMC veterans to fire a sniper rifle. Um, tell me about what that was like. Well, one of my friends is a retired uh, Marine. Well, I have, there's a lot of Marines in St. Phil, thank goodness. I just love them to death. I love all military, but um, I asked if he knew very much about snipers and firing sniper rifles. And so he brought over a book, which was a book that instructors that teach Marines how to fire sniper rifles and all the theory that goes with it. He brought me the book. And I was, whoa, I couldn't believe wow, it. Wow, wow. I learned so much just reading that book. And so I went to take it back. He said, no, you can keep it. And I did. So then I read it again, underlined, highlighted, and all this. And I, I used information in the book because there is a sniper. And he said, Would, have you ever fired a, a sniper rifle? And I said, no, I don't even know much about them except what I had read. He said, well, would you like to? And I said, oh, yeah. So he arranged with several other Marines. Um, they got the a row bar, which is probably the best. And this was like a seven, $8,000 rifle. Um, and then other forms of firearms. We went to a private uh, property where they had fire range set up. So the target was an, about an inch thick steel it's about three or four feet square, about 500 yards away. Then they had a table set up, and then they had the sandbag, so you could rest on the sandbags. And then they had a, a bipod, so you put the bipod down on the rifle uh, to balance it. And then there was a, a scope, which you had to find a sweet spot and, and uh, fire the rifle. You couldn't hear, you couldn't see where it hit. You could hear it, however. Um, and it, there was no recoil. This, this was a, a beautiful rifle. And then I did uh, several other types of rifles, too, but the Robar was just fantastic. And you can go online, look up Robar, R-O-B-A-R, and learn more about the Robar rifle. Uh, but that was the sniper rifle that I used also in the book. And uh, the sniper was from Sri Lanka. Uh, in wow. The, in, the, in the book, from yeah. Sri Lanka. And, yeah. and when I was in 
Southeast Asia, I went to all these different countries. And so when I speak about one of those countries, it's, it's from firsthand knowledge. Anything that I say in there, I've been there. Uh, been there, not done all that, but I've uh, <laughs> been there and wow. know the area, met the people. So when we talk about the sniper, it's, it's pretty accurate, all, all the things that he does and what he feels and, and things like that. Very and, cool. Uh, one of the other things that I think is very interesting in uh, in the book is um, single hemispheric sleep. And the hero goes to sleep, but many times if you're in combat, and I've never been in combat, thank goodness, but men and women in combat, if they go to sleep fully, they could be dead. They're like right. a dog keeps one eye open. Well, they keep one half of their brain awake and it's called single hemispheric sleep and they do this for so long I mean at night they never fully sleep they don't they don't fully rest and they become sleep deprived and this creates all types of problems and if you look up my name Irene Barron single hemispheric sleep I've got quite a few blogs on my website about that because many veterans come back and they're not the same as when they left and it's due to that single hemispheric sleep and all the things it causes, the, all the, oh, so many things. And one of the most horrible is thoughts of suicide because they don't know what's going on with them. Um, and, and they still, once they, once they start that single hemispheric sleep to protect themselves, um, they don't stop it. They're still doing it when they get back and they don't even realize it. They have no idea that, they, that such a thing even exists. Oh and my, my hero was, was killed because, um, unfortunately, the heroine thought she would let him have a good night's sleep and made him go to sleep with both sides of his brain, and he had a hard time getting up out of that. They, he got up very quickly, but but uh, men in, that are that are in combat and fighting zones they can't sleep fully, and that causes a lot of veteran suicides. So well, I'm, so I'm what, very wow I'm, wow. How do they? How do you learn how to do single? Speaking as a mother of young babies, I think I know. But how do you do single hemispheric sleep? How do they train them how to do that? They don't. It is something the body does automatically. If you if you go to a new hotel, you don't sleep very well the first night. You're you've got half your brain's awake waiting for something to happen. You go camping, it's the same thing. You go to some place new, you're going to probably have single hemispheric sleep the first night or week or something. It's a self-preservation instinctive thing that they do. They're not trained to do it. And they're trying, they don't even make, they probably don't even realize they have it when they get back to the state. Oh, I see, they, I see. I think a lot of doctors don't even realize they have it. And I've written to many different doctors and Walter Reed and made, you know, sites, different places uh, to talk about it. But a lot of people don't even know it exists. And it, it causes so many problems with veterans. Their families say they're not the same. You know, they can't change how all the side effects that the hemispheric sleep has caused. And, and my website lists them, the PTSD, the suicide. It causes um, emotional stimulus is changed. They, they get mad. They get happy. Their memory is partially gone. Their motor skills might decrease. Wow. It's just so, wow. Well, we're so going to... Um, so is there a treatment for this? Like... Um, like in, in your book, Anna Masterson was able to get her um, that major culture or whatever to sleep. How did? Well, we'll come back and we'll talk about that. So, so maybe there's a there's a little secret in there that that you can help um, with. So we're we're going to take a break, and um, again we're we're open to the callers eight six six four five one one four five one. We're with Irene Barron from irenebarron.com. Please go on her website, and sounds like she has some amazing blogs that that could be helpful for um, for people. And uh, we'll be right back. Author, 
radio show host and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and to in radio. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale, an international initiative called Nurse Nursing Now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing, Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. And welcome back. We're coming to you live from BBM Global Network Radio. And I just want to remind you that um, our shows are, are um, recorded and they're sent out as podcasts. You can find me on iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio and any place that has podcasts. Look for the Angelscape Show. We're with Irene Barron tonight. Look Irene up at IreneBarron.com. She has some amazing information Um in her blogs as well. They'll be very uh, good to, to read up. So we left off, Irene, we were talking about single hemispheric sleep. Now you have a lot of information that you've written about. And uh, could you tell me more about that? It seems like you wrote it into the book as well. Well, my hero was sleeping that way all the time. And it was recognized by the telepath. He, his main job is to guard. He's like the bodyguard for the telepath which when the book starts, he detested anything psychic. He didn't even want to be in this organization, but was ordered to do so. Uh, he didn't want to be around any psychics, and then he stuck uh, being a bodyguard for one. <laughs> it's just a lot of dual, uh, what do you say, arguments and a lot of things happening. And a lot of things change over the length of the book. But he was asked to not only guard her, and then uh, if it was a... If blood was necessary, you know, her life was more important than his at that point, they said, because she, she was going to be able to maybe find someone to stop the terrorism in the United States. All he was was the bodyguard, but he becomes much more than that. So oh, he does. She yeah. Finds, yeah, she finds when he sleeps, and he doesn't really sleep all the way, uh, when they were in, a, in Laos in this one cave, they were being... They were put there by uh, a Buddhist monk who was in charge of one of the monasteries, trying to keep them. They had behind their ears, it's uh, like a little nanobot they're putting in your body with the, with the vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, they had one behind their ear. Uh, the skin is translucent, so this was powered by solar. And it was very tiny, I mean, smaller than a rice grain, just, you know, maybe a tenth of the size of a rice grain and it was a transceiver so any the people that uh in uh new york at their underground top secret facility could hear anything they said and that was all recorded uh, in case that needed to be found or studied and then they could also be talked with um, like a radio so but it was also by satellite so they could be tracked just like you could once you have that virus nanobot you can be tracked any place in the world so it was the same type of thing and um, but anyway she knew 
when they were in Laos in one of these caves trying to keep away from these uh, people that were trying to kill her. Since, since she could identify terrorists, they don't want to be identified, so they needed to get rid of her. She was on every terrorist kill list in the world. And they are trying to trace her uh, through the satellite. Someone got a link to it, so they're trying to trace her. But in a cave, uh, they might be protected, which is why they were in this one cave. Um, but when she discovered that he wasn't sleeping totally, uh, she decided that they had been in such wild events that she was going to make both sides of his brain go to sleep. And that got them into some problems because they were attacked that night. Um, but going back to the single hemispheric sleep, people that, let's say, firemen would be, would probably have single hemispheric sleep, policemen, anyone that is in a high stress job where they don't really sleep well, it's not that they're not sleeping well, it's just that they're only sleeping with one side of the brain. The right side of your brain is the one that sleeps. That's emotion, intu uh, intuition, um, art, beliefs, big pictures, you know, face recognition. But the left side of your brain stays awake. That's your logic, your analysis, organization, math, science, knowledge, facts, details, strategy, safety. Mm. Your left brain is awake. And they do that so long that it becomes lifelong and they don't even realize they're doing it. And most doctors don't realize they're doing it either, unless they were tested, actually tested to make sure when they slept that both sides of the brain were sleeping. So wow. that results in the person going having PTSD, suicide thoughts. Um, they get angry quickly, anxiety, sad or happy. Their memory is reduced. Um, even their motor skills might be reduced. Reaction times could slow down. They don't make good decisions. Um, and their body, the brain can't clean itself. It cleans itself at night when it's asleep. And when it cannot cleanse itself, it's reduced in, in its activity. Their metabolism is decreased. And the blood pressure, heart rate, you know, hormones, you know, collagen decreases. The skin, skin might break out or wrinkling. Or your immune system is affected. An intentional sleep, they they're, they're, have such sleep loss, they just might fall asleep anytime, whether they're driving or who knows what. And then, of course, suicide is the most horrible one when you have so many veteran suicide deaths. People say, why, why? And I said, here you go, guys. This is why. They have so they're, the they're single hemispheric sleep. Ta -da. Mm -hmm. And read about it in my blog. Um, look up Irene Barron, uh, Hemispheric Sleep. And on my website, um, I have a blog index, and my blogs are categorized. There's a section for military, uh, many different types of blogs, a lot in astronomy, being in a, heavy in astronomy. But people can read about that, and you might be able to help someone. And we'll address it. I, I would love to make sure when I first learned about this with, was, with Scientific American Mind magazine proved that people have a sleep existed and so that was one of the things that came out of this book also wow uh, and uh, that, that's just amazing irene um that you were able to speak about this and it, it sounds like um, a, a really important health issue that <clears throat> coming out of it it's huge just huge so um it is it affects yeah. every every veteran anyone that's been in combat any Firemen, any policemen. Look at look at what the police nowadays have to go through. I'm sure they can't sleep ever with the full brain anymore. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's incredible. Guard. Yeah, anyone whose life is critical like that, that could be taken from them any instant. So they, when they Anna helped, when the when the character Anna, and we're going to take a break in a minute, but I just got to ask this last question: When the character Anna helped Major Coulter fall asleep. How did she do it telepathically in your imagination? Did she, like, hypnotize him, or did she just mind meld with him, or what happened? Your mind has chemicals which it releases, uh, and endorphins. Uh, they have many different names, but she just released some chemical in his brain that relaxed the body. Um, okay. And 
in the in the next book, one of the one of the mind readers that they come across became addicted to her own <laughs> chemicals in her brain, which is a big. Oh, oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Well, we're going to take a quick break, and uh, I want to talk more about that coming addicted to your own thing. Um, so we're going to. Um, take a break and we come back we're going to talk about how to be, become addicted to your own brain chemicals i'm just kidding but we're coming to you <laughs> live from bbm global network and tune in radio this is angel escapes i'm your host with nancy smith and uh, when you come back when we come back please call with any questions 866-451-1451 Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. Yeah, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. And welcome back. We're coming to you live from BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Later on, we'll be on iHeartRadio or whatever um, podcast um, you enjoy. This is Angelscapes, and I am your host, Nancy Smith. Uh, We are taking calls, 866-451-1451. And we're talking to Irene Barron um, about her book, Mind Reacher. You can hear, uh, read more about Irene and more about the book at irenebarron.com. But what the fascinating part is that we're talking about is um, using the gifts of telepathy and all the super gifts um, to help keep the country safe, to, to, to use it in military um, purposes. And I was asking you um, on the break, like, where was your inspiration for the, the main characters in the book? But also, um, so let's go back and talk about that. But first, let's start with the uh, South African, those kids that are really, truly real. They're in their middle age right now, but they were born um, with these um, incredible abilities in their minds. Okay, they're not telepaths. They're just very no, they're brilliant. Not. They were yeah. very brilliant children. And so they should be, if they were born in the early 70s, so that's 80, 90, you know, you can see it be 40s, uh, they're going to be middle-aged right now. So I was mentioning if you look around the world at people that are extremely brilliant, were they born in Johannesburg back in the early 70s? Mm. And I haven't, there's some that are extremely brilliant that, are known to have been coming out of South Africa, but I bet South Africa's got some extremely brilliant people living there right now if they're still there. So why not do you telepaths? Suppose, do you know why they those these? I know they're not telepaths. This is this is one of your inspirations for the, you know the the book. But what made them so brilliant and smart? Was there did did you have an idea about how that happened, or was there some kind of? Yeah, from from what I understand, the doctor. Uh, you know what thalidomide is? Thalidomide, yep. The, th- the thalidomide babies in Germany and Europe were born without hands and arms and legs and sometimes just a torso, neck, and head. You know, it was just 
40,000 or more of these children are living in Europe, middle age now, from a chemical that the mothers were given to, to take away pain or to let them sleep or something, saying that it was safe. And this doctor in Johannesburg did not want to have that happen to any of his patients. Didn't like it. If a lady is pregnant, you're not supposed to have coffee, tea, chocolate, alcohol, tobacco, anything that's going to be an amphetamine or a sedative. You don't want that in your body. You want healthy food um, and water. You know, even the water nowadays is not that healthy. I would advise having a pregnant woman drink distilled water, you know, and take your minerals on the side. But from what I understand, it was like a, an apparatus that was made... Uh, partially out of a barrel and like a, a scuba diver would have the black leather, a black plastic rubbery material to, at the neck and the legs. So they could be sealed off and then he had a vacuum attached to that from what I, if I recall correctly. And he would, when he re started the vacuum pump and the pressure was reduced inside, that reduced pressure on the uh, uterus and relieved any pain and pressure on the mother. And at, and I'm not sure how long they would stay in something like that if they did. Um, but if they did, during that time, it would be like having a child in space without gravity. You don't have any impediments to oxygen, and food would go into the brain the way it's supposed to go in in a perfect situation. So... Any of your children that are born in space are going to be extremely brilliant because um, there was nothing to stop that oxygen from going right into the brain and let the brain grow the way it's supposed to and with the food. So he was doing the same thing down in Johannesburg. So these children, for the time he did that, uh, were extremely brilliant. He, it's, it frightened the parents. The reason they had the article, I think it frightened the parents because children were so much more brilliant <laughs> than they were in some cases. Oh, my goodness. But since yeah. the Hunter Institute in Australia discovered that intelligence is on the X chromosome. So if you're, if you're a fellow, if you're male, you got your intelligence only from mother. But if you are female, you got your X chromosome from mother and father. So you have the intelligence match there. So um, the intelligence is inherited, but uh, if if your body as a fetus, as a embryo, as a baby can't get mm -hmm. the oxygen for some reason because mother smokes, your food is impaired because of the alcohol or drugs or whatever, your brain is impaired and may be damaged before you're born. There's nothing you can do about it. So, but these children mm -hmm. did exist. They were not telepathic. They were just, they just had, uh, this doctor helped the mothers in a way that was non-chemical to, and that just allowed the brains to have the oxygen, the food they needed to, to grow the way it was supposed to. Wow. And this is real deal stuff. So, um, that real is, life. That is. Yeah. But in my book, they were telepathic. <laughs> But it, yeah, so you took so it a step farther and just said, "Well, if their brains were, what if they were telepathic?" Which is which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and yeah. uh, well, I, I wonder if the science from Johannesburg will ever spread throughout the, you know, the world. But let's um, talk a little bit more about your inspiration for some of the other main characters. Um, I feel like you have the your your background with the military but you also have a lot of other backgrounds so talk to me about these who was your favorite character and 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 uh who was their who is the inspiration for them uh one of my favorite characters was um colonel andrew anderson and uh, he was extremely brilliant he uh worked with the uh, government and uh, was in the military. He was he had the knowledge that anyone needed when when anyone was uh, in any of the military. If they needed knowledge about something, he didn't forget things, and he would be used from this place and that place. But he was getting on in his years, so uh, the president asked him to be the main doctor. He was a medical doctor, psychiatrist. Um, 
the president asked him to be the main doctor in that. Okay. So he, I, if this were ever a movie, I would have loved to have James Earl Jones take his place. Oh, my gosh. That would be the perfect <laughs> act for the, the, oh, if it were a movie. I could totally um, see that. He would, be, he would be the perfect person. Nice, nice. So we're going to take another break. So think about your next favorite character when we come back and and also, you know, that kind of thing and and what what you'd like to leave behind. Um, So we are going on a break now. And um, when we come back, um, we have going to be wrapping this up and uh, with Irene Bear. And so if you have any last minute calls, please call in 866-451-1451. This is Angelscapes. I'm your host, Nancy Smith. And you can also find me um, on angelscapes.net. Or you can find me on Facebook at uh, Nancy Smith of Angelscapes or Soul Power Living, How to Create a Life You Want and Love. So we'll be right back. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. And welcome back. We're coming to you live from BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio, and this is Angelscapes. I'm your host, Nancy Smith. We are with Irene Barron, and we're going to talk a little bit more about her favorite characters and what in her life um, um, developed them. And, and you know, from so so, let's go. You had uh, Colonel Andrew Anderson, and who was the next favorite character, and, and what did you use from your life to develop them? Um, the Major John Coulter, who was the bodyguard. When he was in high school and graduated from high school, he went to China to the Shaolin Temple uh, in Henan province in China. It's a Buddhist Shaolin Temple. It was founded in the 5th century, and they teach martial arts. Most of the martial arts, such as Kung Fu and many others, started in areas like that. And so in my book, he stayed there four years and became very proficient with that and learned that peace was something that was to be, he wanted to be one of the best in the world with the Kung Fu but he also strived for peace so when he came back home to the United States knowing he wanted peace he joined the United States Marine Corps to help ensure peace different places so that's how he got into the Marines and as I, I studied uh, martial arts locally uh, so that I could understand, because it is used in the book. There's uh, some attacks on martial arts, and I need to know what to do and how to do it and what it felt like. And what I couldn't do personally during my lessons, the instructor would do with uh, someone else for me to show me so I could video what was happening and use that in my book. But in the process, I did a lot of work with the shale and temple of uh, they have a huge mural which pictures all these different types of art. And um, and then I, some of the monks there would send me emails, and it was very interesting to communicate with them. But because of that, I think he uh, is one of my favorite people because he, he wanted peace, which is, you don't think of someone wanting peace to go into the United States Marine Corps, but what would you do for peace if you weren't in the, a diplomat? Right, that right. would be wonderful to do it. Well, that was a, that's a very inspiring, Miss Irene. That that's very inspiring. We're kind of winding things down, Irene. I just want to remind you guys to go to irenebaron.com. Mind Reachers is uh, also available on Amazon um, for you to to grab. But I also go on her website because she has two other amazing books that are very scientifically researched and Christian based. Um, and Irene, um, is there any last thoughts you'd like to leave with our listeners? about 
you know, the message that you had from Mind Reachers or anything like that? Well, if you want to read a book that is so new, it's a totally new style. People say that they've never read anything like it in their life. And they were just blown away to, to see all the things that were, came in, all the, all the minor stories that were within the book. And it, the people that have read it just say, wow, they want the next one. And one fellow said, uh, um, well, I can't remember exactly what it was, but they compare me to other other writers, which is, is wow. very nice. And you have a second book coming out and um so grab hold of mind reacher um read it by the time you're done she'll have the next one out um and uh, so we are so grateful that you you came and talked to us irene um you kind of gave us some some inspiration for creative thinking and all that kind of thing and i uh, congratulations on on the beautiful work that you've been doing and this is um Angelscapes. I'm your host, Nancy Smith. You could reach Irene again at irenebaron.com. You could reach me at angelscapes.net. And you can also reach out um, to Facebook to Nancy of Angelscapes or Angelscapes or Soul Power Living, Create a Life You Want and Love. And Irene, are you on Facebook as well? I am. I am on Facebook. Um, I have a professional and a personal. And then there's mindreacher.net on Facebook also. Okay. Look Mind, for my- my friend- Okay, great. So we'll look for Mind Reacher on Facebook, mindreacher.net, and irenebaron.com. And thank you so much, Irene. And I'm going to say good night to everybody, and I hope you enjoyed this amazing sci-fi author special interview. And we'll see you next week. This has been Angelscapes with host Nancy Smith. Tune in each week as Nancy discusses ideas, tips, and lessons to help you open to receive divine love, joy, and soul power in your life. You can discover the powerful being you really are right here on Nancy Smith's Angelscapes. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.